This week we read about the very first Passover, when God passed over the homes of the Jews. Obviously, God had to command the Jews all the laws pertaining to Passover. The sacrifice, the blood on the doorpost, the matzah, the maror. But before he did that, he gave them another command. Blink and you'll miss it. It takes up one passage. You'd think that because this is the very first law that the Jews are getting as a nation, it's got to be one of the big ones, maybe one of the Ten Commandments, but it's not. Surprisingly, curiously, it's the law of the sanctification of the new moon. Why is that the first law we get as a nation? The answer, according to one of the commentators, is that there's so much built into that law. Think about it. When God brought the ten plagues, disrupting nature, he was showing Pharaoh and his nation and the other nations and us that the same God who was disrupting nature was the same God who was creating and maintaining nature. Pharaoh didn't get that point. We did and we should. And so God was giving us a physical sign up in the heavens, the crescent moon, right before we became his nation. The same way that he had given Noah a physical sign in the heavens after the flood, the rainbow. And God was also showing us that every month, just as the moon reunites with the sun and starts reflecting the light of the sun coming out of a period of darkness, each one of us individually and as a nation should come back to God after whatever period of darkness we've been in, like the one we've been in now for months. He's waiting to see us, and we should be running to see Him. And God's reminding us through the laws of the new moon that we can always renew the same way the moon comes back. Each one of us is in control of our individual spiritual and moral destiny. No one else has control over that. Each one of us does, and we can always come back. We can always renew, just like the moon. I want to share with you a comeback story. A few weeks ago, I was in Israel, and I was speaking at a certain yeshiva. And right before I finished, I told the guys I have one more story to share with you. I know a guy who, when he was a teenager, came to Israel for the year to study in yeshiva, and it did not work out. He was forcibly relocated. In other words, he was thrown out of yeshiva. And he figured, you know, when a police officer leaves the force, thrown off or retired, he hands in his gun and his badge. Well, I'm going to hand in my yarmulke and my tefillin and my tzitzes and my sitter. I'm done. I'm leaving. But while he was packing his bags to leave, one of the rabbis from the yeshiva came to visit him in his dorm room. And he said to him, no matter what happened between you and the head of the yeshiva, the Rosh Yeshiva, I want you to know that I believe in you. And in no small part because of that conversation, that fellow did not leave the force, didn't leave the reservation, did not turn in his gun or his badge or his yarmulke or his tefillin. He stayed the course, at least on the margins, and eventually over time got much more serious about his Judaism and returned to Israel many, many times in the ensuing years, but not once. Over the next 35 plus years did he ever set foot in the yeshiva that had thrown him out. Until tonight. Until right now because I was that guy. Don't ever give up on anyone.